welcome to the Women in Security panel at AppSec California 2018. Um, my name is Caroline Wong, and I'm thrilled to be moderating. Um, so why are we talking about women in security? If you were to look in this room, there's a ton of women in the room, right? I guess throughout the industry, there's a number like 11%. I think that, you know, sometimes women in our industry, maybe they have a little bit of a different experience than men in our industry. Uh, but that said, with today's panel, I think what we'd really like to highlight is some brilliant women in the industry who've been successful and who are thriving. And to have an opportunity for these women to share their stories and also for the audience to ask questions. So we're actually gonna start off with about 20, 25 minutes of getting to know our brilliant panelists. Uh, and then we'd really like to open it up to the audience. We of course have some prepared questions with regards to topics like work-life balance, relationships in the office place, uh, experiences working in the industry, um, and thoughts on diversity. Um, but if you have questions for our panelists, uh, then what we'll do is I'll announce the Q&A uh, and we'll pass a microphone around uh, so that we can get your questions answered as well. I do want to say before we kick off that the industry has a talent gap. We all know this. Anyone in the room who's a hiring manager uh, probably has trouble <laughs> finding really great people for their team. And it's so interesting to me that in an industry with such a major talent gap, we also have a really major diversity gap. So to me, it's sort of like, maybe if we're able to solve one of these problems, then we can solve the other one too. Um, I ask the question of myself a lot, why are there fewer women and minorities working in our industry? And I don't know the answer to that, but with the fact that we've been given the opportunity to, s to be up here and to share our stories today, you know, maybe by sharing our stories, we can inspire other women, other, you know, people of color, other minorities to think like, hey, their jobs are awesome, their lives are awesome, maybe that's work that I want to do too. Uh, so I'll start off with a very brief introduction to myself, uh, both as a professional uh, as well as a human who happens to have female body parts. Uh, my name is Caroline, I was born in San Francisco, my father was born in the Fiji Islands, my mother's from Hong Kong, uh, my husband and I live in San Francisco with our two dogs, two cats, and soon to be two kids. Uh, I've been working in the information security field for the past 13 years. Uh, started off on the practitioner side, leading security teams at eBay and Zynga, um, and more recently have transitioned to the vendor side, uh, done some product management at Symantec, some management consulting at Sigital, and in 2016 I joined Cobalt, uh, which is a pen testing as a service company. And I'll ask each of our esteemed panelists uh, to please share some of your story with us. Um, really what I'm interested in is your security origin story. You know, who are you? How did you get into this field? What do you love about this field? And anything else that you'd like to share with everyone? What end do you want to start at? Just All right. Right here is really good. Hi, I'm Megan Wu. I am a senior security consultant for Rapid7. Uh, I work for a group called the Strategic Advisory Services Group, and what we do is we go out to organizations and we assess um, where they are from a cybersecurity maturity standpoint, and then we give them recommendations on how to improve. Uh, we talk to their boards of directors, executives, um, and their uh, security teams. So it's really interesting and I love it. Um, I also figured out during lunch, I'm actually, I think I'm the youngest on the panel. So I only have about six years of working IT security uh, experience. Um, 10 years in the community though. Um, so how I got started in security was I was 14 years old and my father, uh, he started working at the Veterans Hospital in St. Petersburg, Florida where I'm from and where I currently live. And when I wasn't in school, because I tend to get in trouble, <laughs> he made me volunteer at the Veterans Hospital, specifically at the IT department. 
because I was surrounded by his coworkers who were like five or six guys. So it was a whole bunch of uncles making sure that I didn't mess up. <laughs> so um, they taught me at a really early age. I think I took apart my first computer when I was six or seven years old, coding HTML by seven, that kind of thing. And then when I was 13, they got hit by their first major virus that we were there for. And so I got to sit while they tried to do instant response and clean up. And I just became fascinated by the whole thing. I'm like, wait, you can make computers do things they're not supposed to do, you know, and really dove into that. And then uh, when I was 19, I went to my first DEF CON. And from there, I met a whole bunch of great folks. I participated in Lost's Mystery Box Challenge. Not sure how many of you all are familiar with that, but basically, uh, Lost creates this really impossible challenge with different components, and then you have the weekend to figure it out. And so I dove right in, worked with my team. Uh, basically, I found people in line. I'm like, you're going to be on my team. And they were like, oh, OK. So from there, I met other folks and started volunteering, B-Sides, DEF CON, um, and then started presenting. And I just fell in love with the community and knew this is what I wanted to do for a living. Awesome. Megan, thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you. Excellent. <clears throat> well, hello, everyone. My name is Chris Kubeka. I have a slightly different uh, story, as we all do. Um, I uh, got started in security at a pretty young age. Uh, part of my family was in intelligence. And uh, I was kind enough, my great-grandfather taught me uh, the Caesar cipher before I started going to first grade so that I could hide my notes and everything like that. <laughs> that was pretty cool. And my mother had started out as an operator for Digital Corporation. She ended up being a robotics programmer. And uh, from our background, my family comes from Puerto Rico. And she was a single mother, didn't have much money for daycare. So she put me in front of a green screen at Digital. Sometimes I'd help her out at night changing these hard drives that were huge platters and stuff like that. And she got me these magazines where you could type in and program your own game. And when finally the computer said boo, because it was a haunted house one, I was in love. I absolutely adored it. So uh, a few years later, um, I uh, um, got my computer privileges taken away. And uh, so uh, after uh, having an incident with the Department of Justice and the FBI. But when I turned 18, um, the Air Force, uh, after I was allowed to use a computer again, I couldn't even use a gaming console. It was really depressing. Yeah. Uh, they took my Atari from my house. I cried. They actually came in the house. It was bad. But it, yeah. So um, the Air Force uh, uh, issued me a moral waiver and brought me in. And so <laughs> I ended up uh, doing a, a flying career on the side. I was also doing uh, networking and security for my day job. And then after I was injured, I went to Space Command and did security for, uh, at the time, a, a secret facility. Um, but it was lots of fun, because space is fun. And moving forward, um, a couple of years ago, I left uh, Ramco after their Shamoon attacks. Uh, they, oddly enough, but interestingly enough, uh, gave me a call to help establish their network operations, security operations, uh, information security, uh, EU and UK privacy and a joint international intelligence team uh, for the Aramco family and I covered all of EMEA in South America outside of Saudi Arabia. Um, I, I had a, a budget that was larger than the GDP of some countries. Uh, so that was a lot of fun, uh, a lot of chaos um, and uh, it, it uh, I really got my hands dirty on uh, that one to uh, try to make sure that they were recovered and stable. And uh, because of the market share of Saudi Aramco, whenever um, a company like that is basically halted for their business operations, I believe they provide 25% of the world's energy in one way, shape, or form. Uh, we were facing a very big problem where if they could not recover, we could have had oil prices up from 400 to 400. And $50 a barrel. So luckily they were able to recover and um, I had a uh, very interesting uh, cyber warfare attack and uh, very interesting company. And I uh, moved forward. I'm now the CEO of my own company and I've gone out on my own as a cyber warfare expert and an expert in critical infrastructure. So things change.
Yeah, they do. That is very exciting. Mine is not that exciting. So I just want to set your expectations. <laughs> Hey everyone, my name is Colleen Coolidge. Uh, currently the position I hold is head of security at Segment in San Francisco. Um, in the last couple of years I've been doing a lot of startup security. So what that means is going to a company that's you know fewer than 200 people or 200 people. Um, they realize, hey, if we wanna grow up, we want money and things, we need to do some security. How do we do that? Um, that's my niche, love to do that. Go into a small company who's really eager to do stuff. They've never worked with security people before, so they think it, it'll be super fun. Um, so I would advise that for any of you who, uh, who want a little bit of a change. Um, and the, the most rewarding part really is introducing the entire company to different aspects of security. Everything from physical security, like why do you need to wear a badge? Why is tailgating bad? Like what kinds of things can happen? To um, software security that they, they really think like, oh, if we just scan some code or do this one thing, that's software security. It's, you know, there's a whole process that you don't know about, but it's okay, we're gonna make it easy for you. Um, and doing enough of that to where the security is going from non-existent to pretty good, and then putting a company in a position for them to go public, because they have to feel like certain things are in order, like their finances have to be in order, they need their revenue to be a certain way, they need their security to be a certain way, um, and then a company feels safe to go public. So um, that's, that's the best. The, the best day is if you work in a situation like that, and everyone helps you with your security program, and everyone pushes you over the line, the day that you see your executives ring the bell in New York City and you're all hugging each other and crying at 6.30 a.m. and it's the best thing ever and you're drinking champagne, that's, that's a wonderful high. So I keep chasing that. Uh, <laughs> didn't always start off this way, was not always working at small companies. Um, originally started doing security in, here in Southern California um, at bigger companies where things were moving really slow and for me it was pretty boring. I didn't like the fact that larger companies, even though they had the budget for it, and they acted like they wanted to do better security for, you know, not just because it's the right thing to do, but because they care about customers and they care about a competitive advantage. Um, when it comes down to it, like, your budget's cut. You don't get to hire that security person. You don't get to buy that tool. They won't adhere to the process. And that was really frustrating for me. So it was just a personal decision to come up to a place where people will actually do what they say they're gonna do, or at least they give it a good try. Um, how I got started in security is kind of a, it's a funny story. It's not, not quite like, oh, it was always in my blood. Uh, as a matter of fact, <laughs> my parents, they don't know anything about this whole thing. Um, I was doing like systems analysis that moved into project coordination and project management. And I had a, a big team that we were trying to get certain things over the line. You know how it is when you run a project, you've got developers, you have QA people, you have stakeholders, business people, vendors, um, and you're managing a, a budget and a project schedule. And in one of our weekly meetings, somebody actually knocked at our conference room door. And I thought, that's weird, Just who knocks at a conference room door? Um, and then the developer in my group peeked over the window and he goes, oh my god, it's that security guy. I'm all, what security guy? Goes, I didn't know we had security. Um, he's all, don't let him in. Um, but I did let him in because I'm courteous. And he goes, hey, my name is Ian. And if Ian watches this, he'll know which Ian it is. Um, and I'm here to do a security design review on your project. And I was looking around, I'm like, those words, I've never heard those words in that sequence. I didn't know what that meant. But the developer knew what it meant. And I sat across from him who was like, oh, no, no, and no, get that guy out of here. And I was just like, you know, let's see what he has to say. How bad could it be? Um, so he reviewed our requirements, looked at our documentation, how are we moving mortgage data around, and he was like, oh, no. Like, if I had to give this a grade right now, it would be like F minus. It's so bad. <laughs> and then I was like, that's why he didn't want this guy in the room. <laughs> it was bad. Um, and then the worst thing was, after he did this and he told us everything we were doing wrong, just like marked everything up, um, I was running another project that was related, and then he showed up to that meeting, too doing the same thing, and I'm just like, why are we being singled out? This is awful. Um, and so after going through a painful three or four weeks with him where he showed me, this is what a security design review, this is why what you're doing concerns me. Are you aware that we have information security policies? I'm all, no, like never, I've never seen them before in my life. Um, that was my introduction to security, and 
after that project was done, he was happy to report that we'd gone from an F minus to like a B plus. And he's like, you don't understand. That's, that's the kind of change that I want to see. We're handling important data, um, and we owe it to our customers, et cetera, et cetera. I was like, OK, good. So do I not need to see you anymore? Are we done here? Cool. See ya. And I, I felt like I don't have to see this guy anymore. About three weeks later, um, I heard this like org change thing. And I saw his name at the very top of the security organization. I'm all, wow, I think that guy got a gigantic promotion. Turns out he was then director of security. And he was starting to put together the new team. And he came by again. He found me and he said, hey, how would you like to be on my team? And I was like, I don't even like you. <laughs> <laughs> No one likes you. No <laughs> one in the room likes you. They don't want to talk to you. They don't want to do what you say. They're so not on board. And he's like, you're the kind of person who can make all this stuff that we have to do like a reality. He's like, that's so rare. I need someone like you on the team to help make that change happen. And I was like, oh, this is like something I definitely don't ever want to do. But I'll try it for a year and see how it goes. Um, and like. Here I am as head of security, so I don't really know what happens other than if you aren't in the security field yet, but you're interested, um, give it a try for a year. You never know. There's a lot of interesting stuff. I could say that everyone on the panel, I, I got a chance to get to know them. I'm really honored about that. They all have very interesting lives. Like, the job is not boring. You won't regret it. So, that's not all right. Yeah, and then, thank you. Um, I could totally vouch for it. It's not boring at all. And that's, I think, the best part about security is it's constantly changing. You're constantly um, renewing your skill set. Um, anyway, my name is Kavya Perlman. I'm the Information Security Director of Linden Lab. Those of you who don't know Linden Lab, it uh, uh, used to be a gaming company. They uh, have Second Life as a gaming platform. And they recently started another uh, product. They launched another uh, product that's in beta right now. It's a virtual reality product uh, called Sansar. And uh, I proudly protect both of the virtual economies. Uh, so that's really something that um, sort of excites me when I wake up in the morning. And then how I got started with security is it's kind of a funny story. So. Um, I grew up in India, and uh, computer science was just like a word, you know, like, oh, computer science, until high school. It was just something that I had heard, and my parents actually deterred me from going to computer science because I was really just good with languages, and uh, they thought, you know, I'd be a good engineer or something, but they just didn't know anything about computer science. But I had this intuition that I was like, no, I really would love to go into computers. And I persisted, continued with that, and did my bachelor's in computer science. And that was that. And I did a bunch of other jobs uh, in India. And then in 2007, I moved to America. And when I moved to this country, I felt, wow, this country has all this freedom and you know, freedom of choice, all of these things to offer. I felt like, you know, I could do anything. Like, mm, I felt like a hippie, like I wanted to do cosmetology. And um, yeah, that's uh, exactly what I did. I went to school for cosmetology, uh, gave up on computer science, didn't think about it twice, and uh, became a hairstylist. And uh, somewhere. In the back of my mind, uh, you know, I always had this sort of technology background, but pursued that cosmetology. I didn't want to give up on it until I had completely tried it. And one of these days, you know, it had been five years. I was just, you know, a successful hairstylist in Chicago, and some guy comes in and he's my client. Uh, talks to me. I'm like, hey, what do you do for work? And he goes, you know, he's a security engineer at a bank. And I'm like, oh, he must be really smart. I wonder how do people do that? So I really remember that thought. And at the end of the conversation, he said, you know, you sound very interesting. Um, um, he recommended a book to me. It's called Cyber War by Richard Clark. So I went home. I downloaded the PDF. <laughs> I liked it so much that I actually ordered the book. I read it page to page. <laughs> And that was it. Uh, that book, reading that as a cosmetologist, I thought, and it's 2011, I'm reading this book, I turned it, and I said, you know what, that's it. 
this is what I'm going to do for the rest of my life. I'm going to do cybersecurity. And I had no idea how. <laughs> and I think that's a story with a lot of us, is sometimes we get this intuition or we get this you know, sort of thought process. We want to get into security, but we just don't know how. And that's when what I did was I Googled. I Googled top 10 schools for cybersecurity. And fortunately, one of the good schools was, were in Chicago. So I went to pursue my master's from DePaul University. And during this time, now, you know, you're, you're a hairstylist. Now you have to go to security. How do you connect those dots for an employer, for example? So I tried to get a tech job. So I was lucky to find you know, a job in the university and try to do technical support for them. And at the same time that I picked up another job because um, I was going through some financial crisis and a divorce and a lot was going on. And then I decided to just change my whole life. So one job, another job as a system analyst and mo more, more or less like a security person because nobody knew what I did. So I was just in the background learning and installing IDS and doing other cool stuff that, you know, nobody really knew. But I was like, you know, hey, uh, that's what I'm learning at school. So it really just connected that dot for me, going from anybody, from any background to security. And that's, I think, is very important for my story is, uh, if you want to be in security, there are like multiple routes. Now, in fact, you can just Google YouTube. There's so many, you know, awesome people putting material out there. But back then in 2011, I just wanted to do, you know, learn more. So that master's degree connected me to it. Fast forward, my first security job. By then, I had already sort of acquired some skill set from college, from working. And that was at a security operations center where I was the frontliner defending, you know, the attacks at the perimeter, reading packet captures and, you know, reading DDoS type of stuff. And, and that was it. Um, uh, I know it's kind of a overwhelming thought that what you, would, you should do when you want to go into security, but I, I recommend that pursue it, just Google it or talk to somebody, talk to anybody, send a LinkedIn request. And uh, that should do it. Thank you. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you. I myself uh, have had the pleasure of getting to know these women over the past couple of months. Uh, and I still have so many questions. Uh, but before we get into my questions, I want to ask folks in the audience uh, if you have any questions for any of us. And we have a microphone for you uh, so that it's captured so everyone can hear you speak. Thanks. Um, so I was just wondering, I mean, obviously there are maybe like 11% of people in security are women, so there are very few, you know, some of us might be the only women in security at our companies. Um, so given that, like how, I mean, if you guys have any experience with this, like uh, finding a good mentor, like how would you recommend going about that? So um, personally, um, there are a few different organizations uh, that offer these sorts of things uh, in a really formal way. Um, the Executive Women's Forum is one. Uh, another one is a group called WISP, Women in Security and Privacy. Um, those are a couple uh, that I'm aware of. Uh, I also think that uh, something you can totally do is attend a show like this, find someone on the panel that you think is really cool, and just ask. There's no harm in asking. Um, so yeah, I think you can also, you know, if you go to shows, great. Uh, if you don't, for one reason or another, a lot of the talks are done on YouTube. Uh, reach out to someone on Twitter, on LinkedIn, and say to them, hey, I think what you're doing is really cool. You know, would you consider having a 15-minute phone call with me? Um, and then maybe see if that develops. I think that, um, you know, there's no risk in asking. Um, and there's a lot of people who are more than happy to share their experience. Um, so I think it's all about not being afraid to ask, not being, af not being um, sort of let down when you get rejected, because sometimes people are busy, sometimes have people have things, um, but there are lots of ways to do it, and I think that's a really great question. Uh, does anyone else have any other thoughts on that? Yeah, so uh, there's actually uh, two other organizations that have kind of mentorship opportunities. 
There uh, is InfoSec Mentors. They have a Twitter presence as well, at InfoSec Mentors. It was started by Marissa Fagan Doozy um, out of San Francisco. It uh, went dormant for a little while, but it was brought back recently by uh, two gentlemen. So that's a really great opportunity. And then for those who want to start presenting at conferences, there's uh, B-Sides Las Vegas. So B-Sides Las Vegas um, and a couple of other B-Sides actually have a program um, called Proving Ground. And so what Proving Ground does is takes first time presenters and pairs them up with the well seasoned presenter. So that way they can kind of build out their first talk with somebody and then the mentor shows up for your first talk so you have somebody to cheer you on. And then I just kind of follow people until they get tired of me following them and I pester them with questions. And our community is great. They're usually great about talking to you about their experiences and answering your questions. Absolutely. Yeah, I like the idea, don't be shy. Uh, I've, I've had a number of mentors that I've met at shows, uh, networking events, randomly, uh, following them, kind of stalkerish. Um, <laughs> but but it's, it's worked. And I still keep getting new people I might be stalking. So go ahead and reach out. I, I like the uh, saying I saw once uh, somewhere on Reddit, someone had to go into a boardroom and pitch the idea of Sharknado. So what you're asking for yeah. is minimal. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. <laughs> there are no bad ideas, only worse ideas. Um, so another another thing that you can do too is it's true. There's there probably aren't a lot of women in security, maybe in the the city that you're in. Um, if you are looking for a mentor who might be very sensitive to some of the issues that you're going through, I would also encourage you to um, hit up mentors who could be in different minority groups. So for example, um, when I became like at an engineering manager level for security, um, I had, I would say, two really good mentors who were African-American black men. Um, and if you don't think that they go through difficult situations at work like we do, you're wrong. Um, so it's, it's good because they can give you like, hey, when promotion, the, the subject of promotion comes up, um, they may face very similar situations to you. Um, or like work being like someone else taking credit for your work or not giving you full credit for doing a big project, like diminishing your work, all of those things. Um, any, anyone who's a diverse mentor would be able to give you some help, especially if you know you find the one woman who's doing security in your city. She's probably already head of some sort of diversity and inclusion thing at her job. Um, what you'll find is usually people, women and minorities are already double, triple, quadruple tasked with, oh, since you're really good at this job, here are five other jobs that you can do to help fix the problem. So just, I would say, be sensitive to that. Um, because many of us already have four or five jobs. Yeah, I, I would just add a little bit to what Caroline said about LinkedIn is uh, for me that has proven to be really amazing tool. In fact, uh, I now actually on the side have my own company which I own uh, together with another co uh, coworker or a friend who I found on LinkedIn who is a security researcher and now together we are devising some strategies to fight phishing attacks and doing some really cool stuff in the research area. Uh, the one thing I would say, though, when you're reaching out uh, to somebody for mentorship on LinkedIn, don't just say hi. Like, don't just say hi, because this is like your first, like, I get that a lot sometimes where people are like, hi, and which is fine, you can say hi, but they say something else. Like, you know, I'm really interested, I would love to help you, but, you know, give me more than just a hello, you know, tell me what you want. And uh, because it's your first time reaching out, you could just say, hey, I would love to get to know you, this is what uh, I'm, I'm into, and maybe drop a line about something about them as well. It's like, what interested you to just sort of trigger this uh, uh, conversation? Because while we are always interested in our self-interest, to get this mentor to talk to you, just like, hey, I really like what you do kind of stuff, you know, to insert that line, and you, you, you might trigger this, you know, life-changing uh, relationship, you never know. And in fact, for that matter, that's how I got to know Caroline, too, is I just said, you know, hey, what does it take for a person to get on a panel like this? And she was like, well, let me hear your story. And that was that, and here I am. <laughs> Thank you.
Yeah, and I, I totally don't even think of myself as, like, I think of Kavi and I as peers, but she reached out. Uh, I was actually talking on a women's panel in San Francisco with the WISP organization, and she said, hey, that's really cool. Here's my story. I'd love to get to know you, and we had lunch and just began to get to know each other. So, um, yeah, definitely reach out. Thank you. Great question. Yes. Uh, thank you. Um, so my question's for Colleen, actually. So when you're trying to build out a security program at a startup, how do you, can you talk a little bit about, like, how do you go about identifying, like, the first areas of investment? Because you're going into a startup, they have nothing, right? At that point, they haven't thought about security at all. So, like, what's that starting point? That's such a good question, because many times when you go into a startup, not only do they have no security, but they might have something that is effectively like negatively scoring them, you know what I mean? So you need to like fill in that hole so then it's even, and then you can start building level one, two, and three. Um, I would say the very first thing that you'd wanna do, like all of us are trained to do some sort of like risk analysis, slap gas, gap analysis, and find out the things that, you know, look at the landscape. What, it, what product are they selling? Who are their customers? What type of data are they transacting? What are their assets? Um, and then you can tr start to figure out who's their com you know, competitors, maybe who might their attackers be, how might they attack, um, and then what, what things are the most valuable. If, if this thing went down for five minutes, would anybody notice? Would people lose money? Would there be reputational value? No? Okay, then move on to the next thing. Um, because when you first go to a startup and you do that gap analysis, all you're going to find are gaps. So your list is gonna be very, very long. It's gonna be many pages. Um, so you have to put different filters on it. Um, and those are the things that you will pick on to start working on first. Um, so for example, if it's a startup, um, and we'll say that they're in Azure or Google Cloud or AWS, and you talk to the infrastructure folks, and you find that the way that they're uh, provisioning these instances, the way that you know, 100, 200 people, and there's only 200 people at the startup, all have access to AWS, you would just be like, aha, well that's a problem. I would say that's probably within the first five, because that probably means from those 100 or 200 people who have access to AWS, how many clicks away are we from destroying the entire infrastructure? Two? Okay, I'm starting there. But you really just need to see, like, out of all the things that are problems, which ones are the biggest problems based on their particular context? Um, and then let the startup know, like, just because you hired me, this one security person, and we'll work, work really hard on this problem, it doesn't mean if you do these three things, everything's gonna be solved. You're like, this is a long slog. This is like when you've decided to go to an organization and say, I'm a, this type of person and I have this type of illness and I need help. It's like, that's the beginning of the good news, but there's so much work that needs to happen. Um, and then what you'll wanna do periodically as you're making this progress, you'll want to reassess and say, okay, if, if it was AWS security, how far have we come? Are we to a point where we're no longer two clicks away? Maybe we've reduced the number of people who have that type of access. Maybe we have two factor. Maybe we have all these other things. So that aside, what's the second most you know, impactful thing that could happen that's really easy to happen? Um, yeah, and the good news about doing security at a startup is pretty much anything that you do is going to be helping them a lot. So it's a good feeling. Uh, hi. Um, this is a really uplifting, a spiritually uplifting panel, and it's really, uh, you know, great. I'm a guy, but I love listening to you. But so I was hesitant about it, bringing this subject up uh, that I'm going to anyway after thinking about it because it's very real and we have to raise the awareness. I was shocked about a year or two ago. I start seeing tweets and blogs about not just disrespect for women in the field, but worse. Things that are happening that blew my mind. And I had no clue about this. It's been going on for years. Um, and I just, whatever you're comfortable about talking about, if you wanted to share, uh, because we all need to be more aware that there are some evil people out there and we got to stop it, and we have to make everyone aware. We got to treat them as outcasts and, and blackball them, and just in general, make an environment more receptive for everyone of different races and backgrounds and, and women. So uh, sorry to bring it up, but it's we can't keep our head in the sand. Yeah, Richard, I, I think that's a great question, and I appreciate very much that you brought it up. Uh, we actually <laughs> we're sort of like an overprepared panel, <laughs> so I have this like multi-page work document that's full of questions that we all like We're talked kind of through. Type a. And 
sort of at the last minute, we were like, oh, we're just going to switch the format, and we're just going to tell our stories, and then we're going to open up to Q&A. But one of the many questions that was included in our very overprepared prep document was, what challenges have you faced? Uh, and I would just like to preface it by saying, whenever anyone, regardless of what sort of body parts and colors you have, uh, experiences something, I think there's an opportunity. Uh, a lot of times, there's good people making mistakes. Sometimes you have not good people, and that's not cool. But every time something happens, there's an opportunity if somebody mistakes you for something. If somebody, for example, uh, maybe someone's walking through a conference expo floor, uh, and they're the decision maker, they're the buyer. You know, but maybe vendors uh, don't treat them that way for some reason or another. There's an opportunity to correct them and say, hey, I'm actually the decision maker for this situation. I'm actually the buyer. And to simply express your truth. I think every time a truth is expressed, that's important. Um, that being said, I will ask our panelists to please share experiences of challenges that you faced and how you responded to them. Uh, and in particular, if there, because I think, Whenever something crappy happens, and that's just life, right? Crap is going to happen. Any of us have an opportunity to either kind of back down and just let it happen, you know, or we can kind of like take the emotional energy that comes with that and use it to lift ourselves up. Uh, and in talking over some of these types of stories just over lunch, uh, I know that that's happened uh, for some of these women. And so I'd, I'd like to invite you to, to respond to Richard's question, however you feel comfortable doing so. Yeah, so I guess the harassment and uh, that kind of stuff kind of takes a whole bunch of different forms, right? So it can be something as... Um, I'm trying to think of the right word, sorry. So it can be something as somewhat innocent as mistaking me as for a marketing or another salesperson. That happens a lot where they're like, oh, okay, I'm gonna talk to the man that you're with because he might be the buyer. Or, oh, you're, you're with sales too? No, actually, no. I can talk circles around you, so bye. <laughs> or there was um, a situation uh, where I was leaving a party, okay. I was leaving a party at DEF CON and uh, a very drunk attendee came up to me and tried to um, sexually harass me and assault me. And uh, off-duty goons actually stepped in and they were just like, no, they completely diffused the situation. So on one hand, I tried to um, approach everybody with compassion, just like, okay, maybe something's going on, they just don't know that they're being an asshole. But Sometimes you just have to stand up for yourself and be like, no, screw you. I earned my seat here, and that's okay, too. There's nothing wrong with that. And I think that we can do better as a community to make things better for folks, uh, whether they be women or people of color. I think um, what has happened recently has actually had a bit of a positive effect. Uh, at least where I come from, from Northern Europe, uh, they have instituted fining for certain types of street harassment, certain types of harassment online as well. You can now be fined. I was quite shocked when I arrived here that uh, within 24 hours I had three instances of gross street harassment and catcalling, and that's not something that I'm accustomed to whatsoever in Amsterdam. And I think that bringing awareness that bad things have happened, realizing that we can stand up for ourselves and that word can get out, and also bringing up the discussion in a positive way, okay, these things can happen, how can we minimize this in the future? And I think sometimes, I think it was a former CIA director said sometimes you have to break an egg to make an omelet uh, type of saying, but I think we can change this around quite a bit, and I think we already started to, in my opinion. I, I would agree with that, and um, we've been in the industry a long time, so it's not as though, oh, this is our first year doing it, and nothing bad's happened yet. Um, many bad things have happened, and yet we're just like, no, I'm not quitting. Sorry, I like this job too much. We're not leaving. Um, but one thing that's true, if you're an underrepresented group, particularly if you're female in this industry, 
Um, the reality is wherever you work, you're gonna be surrounded by men. Um, and as you climb through the ranks and you're a security person, you'll be the only probably engineering manager who's a female, which is the case that I'm in right now and was the last, last couple places that I was at. Um, the important thing to remember is the vast majority of men, and I would say the ones who work in technology, even in you know companies that reportedly have that type of bad behavior, the vast majority of people that you will interact with who are men um, are all potential allies. They're aware of what's been happening because it's getting reported on, and even though it hasn't happened to them, they're finally like reading this stuff and they're like, ah, I, I didn't know this was happening to my female coworkers. This is wrong. Um, but there's another side of it too, like with the Me Too campaign and, and all of that. I think that some of those men by, might even be afraid to speak up because they're like, I want, I don't want this to happen to people I care about. Um, what do I do? What's the safe way to be an ally? And I think men need permission to like, yes, if you happen to be in a room, we'll, we'll say it's like a security design review or some technology discussion, and there's only one woman in there, and people are ignoring this woman. They're talking over her. Um, she'll say a couple of ideas that are really good. No one says anything, and 10 minutes later, a guy says it, and they're like, yes, that's what we should do. Let's go with that idea. When you, when you read, when you see these types of things happening, what we would love from you is um, just a little bit of allyship. It doesn't mean that you have to march with us or like change your whole life, because that's super inconvenient. Um, but in the moment when it's in front of you and you see that situation, um, speak up and say, you know what? No, I, hey, that's a great idea, but you know what? I think we were already talking about that 10 minutes ago. Since you had that idea, why don't you um, give us more information about that? We'd really like to go with that. So just a little bit of, you know, fancy redirection, a little bit of voice amplification, a little bit of tiny bit of correction in the moment. If, if that happened for me, um, at, at my last job, there was, there was a situation where something really bad happened and all of the men in the room who I know cared about me, I cared about them, they were so embarrassed and they were you know, upset by the situation that the person who was abusing me just kept going and their faces turned red and you could tell that they were angry and it wasn't right for them, but they sort of like looked down and just were like, oh God, I hope this thing ends because I care about Colleen and I don't want this to go on. And I had to face this person down myself and it was really terrible. If, if a couple of them had said, hey, you know what? Like there's no reason to get that so upset. It would have shut it down, but instead it went out for like 10 minutes. So yeah, just, just add your voice to ours just a little bit. That's really all we need because the situation I think is already in the process of fixing itself where there's already this momentum, there's a wave. Um, so just, just give it a little push whenever you see that situation. I think that would be really good. Um, so while I hear a, a lot about these things, I read it on Twitter and uh, other social media that there is this aspect of sort of harassment and stuff. Uh, uh, I personally have been sort of lucky uh, and I believe a lot of the uh, credit goes to our group, our community being so supportive and educated. There is just these extremely talented people out here. So uh, at the end of it, what I feel is, uh, and especially after uh, traveling extensively, going to places, I feel like people are people. There are some really bad people or bad men, and there are some really bitchy women too. And for personally me, I've just been lucky to not having experienced that, but I've not been to DEF CON. <laughs> <laughs> it's so and, I, and I was warned. So um, <laughs> minus that, um, it's been great. And uh, honestly, I've been very well respected where I've, wherever I've been. And if uh, respect is what I get for the way I look, I'll take it. <laughs> it's great. I, I absolutely love being part of this community and uh, thankfully, you know, things are actually really changing for better and for the same reason that you are raising that question. That is exactly what is causing the change probably is this awareness and thank you. Yeah, I'd like to, um, we have just five minutes uh, and I want to first uh, thank our panelists, as well as just briefly add something. I thought Colleen's advice to the group, particularly to the allies in this group who might want to affect the situation positively but might not know how to, you know, if there's an opportunity for you to stand up for someone who you see uh, is not being treated right, fantastic. You know, sometimes it doesn't always occur to you in the moment. Sometimes after the moment has passed that, you know, you want to do something and there's an opportunity to, to talk to the person who you saw, 
you know, be treated not right and say like, hey, are you okay? You know, and then also to ask them directly, maybe a couple days later, because sometimes these things take a little time to process. Like, hey, if this were to ha if something like this were to happen again, how would how would you like to be supported? How could I support you? Uh, I think that a, a, a statement like that, a question like that, uh, can really mean a lot to people. So we have just like a few minutes left, and I'd like to just ask the panelists if there are any concluding thoughts uh, that you'd like to leave uh, the session with today. Um, mostly that, yes, we have a lot of work ahead of us, but we are doing better. Uh, we have a lot of allies out there, and even though we joke about uh, or make comments about places like you know DEF CON, they have made tremendous leaps and bounds to improve the culture for the community. And even um, places like Twitter try to stand up for folks who people are piling on to. So, and also just so I don't take up everybody's time, if ever I'm around and you guys need some help, please seek me out and I'd be happy to stand by you and help you guys out. I know things have changed a lot for women in security because Saudi Ramco hired me to help set up their security after they were obliterated. <laughs> so I think things have changed a lot. And there is some more to go, but we're doing it. Yeah, absolutely. I would say for all of you, don't, those news articles are important to read because especially if you're not directly affected by some of those things, it's good to become educated. But I would encourage you, don't cross over to the end, the world's going to hell. I guess everybody's a terrible person. It's not true. Even though we have hard jobs, most of the people that we interact with on a regular basis, we would invite them over for dinner. We would have beers with them. We would, yeah, I don't know, maybe take a local vacation with them. <laughs> maybe not a long one. Um, and so it's really, um, it's really encouraging to hear that people want to get involved, people want to help. Um, but know that, you know, Yes, we face these little, maybe the weird microaggressions every day. A lot of times we're just used to it and we know that it's changing, we'll take steps to change it, but what binds us all together is we know that we have a job to do and we have this job to do with you um, and together we're gonna make this positive change and the rest of it, we just try to shake it off as noise. Um, but you know, appreciate any, any small bits of allyship that you can give us in the moment. Like, If you don't think we notice it, we do and we really appreciate it. Yeah, my last thought are literally just targeted towards anyone who has ever, ever thought about getting into security. Just try it out. It's so much fun, and you would never be bored. That's one thing I can guarantee you. It's a lot of fun. It's hugely challenging, but that is, again, with a lot of reward. So uh, get connected, reach out, Google stuff, get curious. Um, women you know, gone are the times when women were just restricted to kitchen or this kind of a marketing or HR. This is a huge new field, like, you know, uh, building pyramids and all of these humans have perfected building pyramids. And we're just starting out with cybersecurity. So imagine we have a long way to go, which means we have huge opportunity in this field. So uh, get in if you have even a slight bit of intuition that security is something that you're curious about, reach out to any of us, get connected, and get in security. Thank you. Cool. On behalf of our panel today, I'd like to thank the AppSec Cali organizers for inviting us to do this, for allowing us to share our stories. Kavya, Colleen, Chris, Megan, thank you so much. <laughs> <laughs>